So in previous video, we talked about possible kinds of flows, and I said, you know, flow can be not uh, recurrent, not exactly recurrent, aperiodic, it can, but non-wandering, meaning that visiting a set of points called strange attractor, uh, and idea sounds plausible, but what a strange attractor looks like. That answer was first given roughly in uh, 1946, 47, after the first, Second World War, where Lady Cartwright was the first one to actually plot a strange attractor. That strange attractor had to do with duffing model, this vacuum tubes, because during the wa war, the radars and lots of electronics became important, and pure mathematicians uh, were employed by military to solve this kind of problems, practical problems. So the, then the strange attractor was glimpsed by uh, various other people who kind of visualized it, but it was not persuasive to the woman on the street because, you know, it was some kind of fancy mathematics. Until a person who was a humble weatherman, Edward de Lorenz, plotted the first strange attractor. Now, what happened to Edward Lorenz, he was trying to predict the weather, and weather is governed by Navier-Stokes equations. So the simplest weather is you have a flat planet, and there is a flat atmosphere on it. The sun hits the surface of the planet and sets convective flow in this flat atmosphere. So those equations are easy to write down, but they're partial differential equations, and as they describe every particle, in individual mass particle in the fluid, they're infinite dimensional. So what people do is there are various tricks called spectral methods in which you say, well, the solutions look smooth like waves, so let's expand them in Fourier modes, and let's approximate this by first thousand Fourier modes. Now, when Lorentz worked, that was undoable. You could not integrate thousand Fourier modes. Uh, but he was a rich man because he was a weatherman at MIT, and MIT was one of the first places to have computers. So he was able to radically simplify this model in process, losing all the meteorological significance of it, but reduce it to 11 equations, which he could put on a computer. And computer told him that after a while, actually only three of these 11 equations were showing signs of life. So he was actually able to throw away eight of these dimensions and write three simple equations, which are written here, and put them on a computer. Now, this is rather difficult work because computer used to just produce numbers. So out of a computer came a paper, long paper with sets of three numbers. And um, with, you know, a rather small precision. And Lorentz looked at these numbers and they looked sensible. It looked like some kind of oscillation. So what he saw first was that um, Things were just moving like this. That's what you expect. You expect some kind of oscillatory motion of waves, fluids, etc. So that was just fine. But then, to his chagrin, every so often, the thing did a wild jump, boom, to the other side. So suddenly x turned negative instead of positive. He had three variables, x, y, z, and we are showing only two of them. And then the thing kept doing something. And then it jumped again. 
So it went from here, boom, and did this again. Okay, so that could happen. You know, have a system which goes right, 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 and then goes to left, 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 right. So he started looking at sequences of how long it oscillates left and right, and that looked random. There was no rhyme and reason. So he thought his program was wrong. So it worked very hard, etc. Now, the real truth about Edward Lorenz, he was not a humble meteorologist. He was a PhD student of Bir Birkhoff, which maybe was the greatest or one of the greatest American mathematicians of first half of uh, 20th century. And Birkhoff's specialty was ergodic theory or understanding complicated behavior or dynamical systems. So Lorentz realized that this is an example of ergodic system and he analyzed it as mathematician would, but as meteorologist, he wrote it down in a paper you can read today. It's a beautiful paper. It's totally understandable. And he explained that this behavior is not error of computing. This is intrinsic to nonlinear dynamics. And in our course, we will find out a very detailed way of explaining why and how to describe it when it happens. So he produced a very concrete uh, example of strange repeller that anybody could see a picture of. And that had tremendous impact, even though many other people have discovered it before. So out of this came this story about the butterfly, that the flap of the wings of the butterfly will you know, cause a storm in the Pacific Ocean or something which is nonsense, and he, he didn't invent it. Some other people said it first. But, you know, what it says is that very small changes of initial collision when you have a strange attractor uh, produce in finite time such large differences that implication is that the weather is unpredictable. That is to say, no matter how many computers we have and how many thermometers and how we control the sun shining, etc., the weather is unpredictable. So that was a very fundamental result. It's not because we are sloppy or unable to account for all the details. It is unpredictable because the unstable dynamical systems are unpredictable in the following sense that if you have finite precision, no matter how small, you know, you might be able to specify the state of all planets in a solar system is an angstrom precision and angstrom per second velocity, because on computers you can do this. Nevertheless, the future of solar system will be unpredictable. But, you know, that then you ask yourself some more specific question, when does this kick in? And that's where you start really learning stuff.